The next uh, paper is entitled um, Platinum Promotion on Cobalt Silica Fissure Photosynthesis Catalyst. Uh, the paper will be delivered by George Huber, uh, Cal Bartholomew, T.L. Conrad, K. Woolley, and C. Guyman are also on. George Huber, and as the speaker said, I'm a graduate student of uh, Dr. Bartholomew. And there's two main points I'd like to get across in my presentation today. One is I would like to talk about the role of platinum promotion in cobalt silica fissure trio synthesis catalyst and try and classify what type of promoter platinum is in the system. And the second type is the silica support. And I will present the hypothesis, and I hope my data will convince you that my hypothesis is true that conventional silica supports are poor supports for fissure trough synthesis. <clears throat> and um, according to Dr. Iglesia, there's three main types of promoters. There's a textural promoter that increases the number of surface sites. There's a chemical promoter that increases the intrinsic activity of these surface sites. And there's what I will call an active metal maintenance promoter. Um, that, and this promoter helps maintain the metal in the optimal state. And I believe that platinum fits into this active metal maintenance promoter uh, classification here. There's been many good studies done on different promoters of uh, different noble metal promoters. I don't have time to mention all of them, but I will briefly mention uh, three of them. One is platinum promotion of cobalt aluminum by Beta et al. And they show that uh, platinum decreases the turnover frequency, it increases the dispersion, and it increases the reducibility of the catalyst. Another one is by Schenk et al. on platinum promotion again on cobalt alumina and cobalt silica. And they show here that platinum increases the turnover frequency based on the dispersion measurement, but based on steady state transient isotopic kinetic analysis, they show that there is a constant turnover frequency when you, when you add platinum here. And they show that platinum increases the reducibility. There's no effect on selectivity but that platinum increases the coverage of reactive intermediates. Um, another study I'd like to talk about is Iglesia et al. with ruthenium. They show that ruthenium increases the turnover frequency and the uh, C5 plus selectivity. And also that ruthenium inhibits deactivation of the exposed cobalt surface atoms by removing the cobalt, the carbon deposits. And I, I believe that uh, platinum also has the same effect as ruthenium has here. There's one other uh, study I'd like to talk about, and here's some data from Dr. Holman's group on the deactivation behavior of cobalt alumina catalysts. You see the same type of behavior on cobalt alumina catalysts and co rhenium promoted cobalt alumina catalysts. You have here the dry feed, just co you know the syngas feed, then you add water to the feed and you see a sharp <coughs> deactivation, and then you take off that water and you can see the, the deactivation rate slows down but the catalyst has lost a significant amount of activity. You see this on both the cobalt alumina and the cobalt rhenium, the rhenium promoted cobalt alumina catalyst. And we see the same type of effect on the cobalt silica catalyst. And at first glance, you might say that this, this deactivation is due to oxidation of the cobalt surface. But for cobalt silica, I believe that this deactivation is not simply due to oxidation of the cobalt surface, which I will talk about later in my presentation. Um, we prepared three different catalysts. Um, they were 11 weight percent cobalt on silica. We used 0, 0 0.5 and 2.3 weight percent platinum. I know that's a high amount of platinum to use, but we wanted to look at the, and you wouldn't do that for a commercial catalyst, but we wanted to look at the effects that platinum promotion plays in, in this system. We used a non-aqueous evaporative deposition technique in which acetone was the solvent. We use Davis Seal 654, which is actually, it's a fairly large pore support. We chose this support because we, uh, we, we were trying to have a callus that was in the intrinsic regime. And uh, we calcined this callus at 600 degrees C for four hours. 
We use the cobalt nitrate precursor, and we dissolved the cobalt nitrate and the support in acetone, and we slowly evaporated this acetone off with helium gas, and then we uh, dried the catalyst at 60 degrees C overnight. We added the platinum by the same method with the, non with the acetone uh, impregnation technique. And then I think this step right here is uh, very crucial. The reduction step is very crucial for preparing uh, a well this first catalyst. And we did this at a very slow temperature reduction ramp of 1 degree C a minute to 400 degrees C. And then we held at 400 degrees C for 10 to 24 hours at a gas alloy space velocity of 3,000. We also prepared some monolithic catalysts, which I will briefly mention in this presentation. Um, the reason why we prepared this monolithic catalyst is to do kinetic and water studies in our Verde CSTR uh, reactor. Um, we reduced the catalyst in the bulk reduction unit. Um, we reduced a large amount of catalyst in the bulk, our bulk reduction unit. And then we prepared a, a slurry, an aqueous slurry of alumina, uh, alumina binder. The purpose of alumina was to bind the actual catalyst to the monolith. And it was a ratio of one alumina, a weight ratio of one alumina to six uh, of this, this catalyst right here. And then we wash coated that slurry over the monolith. And uh, this is a long, this is a pretty long procedure, but eventually you get the catalyst to stick to the monolith. Um, first, I will talk about the TPR, showing the effects of uh, platinum promotion on the TPR. These are all these catalysts. A, B, and C were all calcined in the TGA. These, this TPR was done in a TGA at a ramp of one degree C a minute, um, and they were cal held at 300 degrees C for uh, two to three hours. And you can see here's the 2.3 weight percent platinum, here's the 0.5 weight percent platinum, and here's no platinum. And you can see that adding the platinum causes the catalyst to reduce at a lower temperature. Now I'd also like to point out D. D, is the, D and C are basically the same catalyst. The difference is that D was calcined in stagnant air as, com as these were calcined in uh, flowing, flowing oxygen. This is calcium stagnant air at a lot faster of a temperature, around 15 degrees C a minute. So you can see that after this, uh, the, the, the faster calcination ramp causes the cobalt to reduce at a higher temperature. And we calculated the extent of reduction at 400 degrees C from the area under the curves here. It was about 100% here, about 100% here, about 95% here, and about, about 100%, 98% or 100% there. In my preprint, I talk about direct reduction versus calcination. Um, the direct reduction, I mean you take the cobalt nitrate and you reduce the cobalt nitrate in hydrogen. And calcination, I mean you reduce the cobalt oxide in hydrogen. Um, the, direct, the direct reduction from the TPRs appears to reduce at a slightly lower temperature. But the problem with the direct reduction is um, when you reduce a large batch of sample, we did, direct reduction works fine if you have a half gram or one gram of catalyst. But when we tried a higher amount of callus, we did 25 grams of callus, we observed a temp uh, temperature runaway uh, in our reduction system. The temperature was at 105 degrees C. We only took data points every eight minutes, so I don't know what happened between that. It jumped up to 160 degrees C, then it jumped back down to 190 degrees C. And so you can't reduce the cobalt nitrates without having temperature runaway for a large batch of catalyst. And this has actually been reported in the patent literature. I found this out. It was reported in the patent literature after I had done these experiments. But this, I'd like to point out this, the slow calcination temperature ramp at a high space velocity leads to TPR profiles that are similar to that of direct reduction. And I think that the slow calcination temperature ramp is very important for preparing a well dispersed uh, catalyst. Here is the catalyst results. We used the method of Jones and Bartholomew. Um, we calculated our dispersion of cobalt. I, I don't know uh, about, we calculated our dispersion of cobalt two different ways. Um, one, we assumed that the cobalt and the platinum formed a solid solution, and that would give us the high value of dispersion right here, 14.3. We calculate the other value, the other way we calculated dispersion is we assumed that the platinum was 50% dispersed and in a separate phase than the cobalt. And that would give us a low value of dispersion. I, I don't know which, which value is more correct, but you can see the two weight percent platinum is anywhere between 11 to 14 percent dispersed cobalt. And then we did this catalyst after reaction. This is the uh, chemical absorption uptake after reaction. 
and you can see quite a number of increase in the chem absorption uptake after reaction. These numbers in parentheses are the standard deviation or chem absorption measurements. We did about three or two, two to four of each of these uh, measurements. The 0.5 weight percent platinum had a lower value than the two weight percent platinum at 9.1 to 9.7, and the cobalt silica catalyst was about 10% dispersed, which is about the same as the well, then experimental error of the 0.5 weight percent platinum and a little bit lower than the 2 weight percent platinum. <coughs> but the interesting thing is the cobalt silica after reaction lost a significant amount of chem absorption surface area. And I will talk a little bit about this later on in my talk. <coughs> Here's the results of our fixed bed reaction run. Um, I'd like to point out just the turnover frequency column and the methane selectivity. The turnover frequency appears to be fairly constant, um, doesn't really be, appear to be affected by the adding the platinum, but the methane selectivity appears to decrease substantially when you add the platinum. We wanted, this is, this is the results from our uh, Verde reactor. Um, we wanted to look at the effects of water on both the turnover frequency and the methane selectivity. So what we did is we held the partial pressure of CO constant at 2.5 atmospheres, held the partial pressure of hydrogen constant at 6 atmospheres, and did this reaction at 220 degrees C. Again, this is the monolithic catalyst. I would like to emphasize that the monolithic prepared catalyst is a lot different than just the plain cobalt silica catalyst due to the effects of, of the binder. <coughs> And uh, right here you can see on this axis, this is partial pressure of uh, water. We introduce water to the feed, and here's the turnover frequency, and the blue dots are the uh, turnover frequency. And you can see as you increase the partial pressure of water, you see very little change in the turnover frequency. But what you do see is the, the pink dots are the methane selectivity, and you can see as you increase the partial pressure of water, you see a drop in methane selectivity, as has been shown in previous literature studies. And um, right here, I put the C6 plus selectivity. And the, as you decrease the methane selectivity, you actually increase the C6 plus selectivity. And so I think this shows that any uh, good reaction transport model needs to take into account the effects of water. Um, this brings me kind of halfway into the middle of my talk. This is uh, a photograph of Utah. Um, you can see how pretty Utah is. And so we'd invite you to come here, but just don't tell very many other people because we don't want it to turn into California. <laughs> That's Dead Force Point, by the way, in Utah. Okay, for the next part of my presentation, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the deactivation behaviors of these catalysts. And uh, about the silica, about why silica is not a good support. This first uh, study we did, it's I call, we'll call temperature program CO hydrogenation. What we did is we did this in a microbalance. We took we reduced the catalyst, and then we added a one-to-one -one mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. We ramped it at six degrees C a minute, and we observed the carbon depositing on the surface. Well, we observed a weight increase, which we assume is carbon depositing on the surface. Um, you can see there's two main regions here. There's a low temperature region with carbon deposits, and there's this high temperature region. Um, this peak keeps on growing until it gets to be about 180%. I don't show that on this graph. And actually, the carbon overflows in the, in the TGA pan and starts spilling out when we did this test. But the neat thing is you can see that 2.5 weight percent platinum, the carbon starts to deposit about 4, 475 degrees C. The 0.5 weight percent platinum, the carbon deposits it doesn't start depositing until we hold it at 500 degrees C for, uh, for a while. And then the unpromoted, directly reduced catalyst, the carbon deposits at 375 degrees C. So these results indicate that carbon helps uh, remove, the, or the platinum helps remove the carbon deposits, or maybe the precursors that lead to carbon deposits. And this is similar to the same type of effects uh, Dr. Iglesias saw with ruthenium promoted catalyst. And here, this is the Unpromoted catalyst, these two are the same catalyst scan, but this was calcined at 300, at 300 degrees C in stagnant air at the faster, uh, faster ramp. And you can see that at the faster calcination ramp, the carbon actually forms at a lower temperature. OK, 
Okay, here's these are the cobalt cabosyl catalysts. Um, these were prepared, these catalysts were prepared as the same way as the cobalt davisyl catalyst. And you basically see the same type of behavior on cobalt davisyl catalyst, but these graphs uh, illustrate my point that I'm going to make about them. Um, the first one you see you have time on stream versus uh, CO conversion. And you can see that for about 60 hour period, this catalyst appears to be fairly stable. This is done at 200 degrees C, 20 atmospheres, hydrogen to CO ratio of uh, 2 to 1. And so that's not very interesting. But what is interesting is when you go up to a higher conversion, you start seeing a, a huge deactivation rate. And the difference between this and this is the partial pressure of water. This one, the partial pressure of water is 0.6 atmospheres. For this graph, the partial pressure of water is 2.7 atmospheres. So the question is, what is causing this deactivation? The first thing I said is, well, what's causing this deactivation is, uh, is oxidation of the cobalt surface. So if it's oxidation, then you should be able to regenerate your catalyst, just re-reduce it, and then you should be able to get back to this initial point of activity. So we re-reduced this catalyst, and we were still at this activity level. We didn't see any increase in activity level. So then we said, well, maybe carbon deposits are causing this deactivation although that doesn't make, seem to be any sense because you don't get any carbon deposits here. And so we oxidized the catalyst and we reduced it and still we saw it didn't see any increase in activity. So this led us to look at the BET surface area both before and after reaction. And we see, okay, this is the cobalt catalyst catalyst. Here is the change in activity, change in chemical absorption surface area, and change in BET surface area. The cobalt cabosyl run at low conversion, it actually gained a significant amount of BET surface area. Of course, we had to take the waxes off before we uh, looked at the BET surface area because the waxes will block the uh, nitrogen absorption, we found out. But the cobalt cabosyl catalyst, this is the one run at high conversion, lost 80% of its activity and it lost almost 80% of its BET surface area. Okay, we did two different cobalt unpromoted cobalt davisyl catalysts. Um, you can see here the loss of activity is almost proportional to the loss of BET surface area. And here the cobalt, another cobalt davisyl catalyst. Again, you can see while the loss of activity is not exactly proportional to the loss of BET surface area, but you do see both a loss of BET surface area and chemical absorption surface area and activity. And the platinum promoted catalyst doesn't really fit this trend because you only see a slight loss of activity. The reason why you only see such a slight loss of activity here is because this was only run over about 20 hours or something like that. But you see an increase in chemical absorption surface area and you see a decrease in BET surface area. So this led us to conclude that something is happening during this catalyst, uh, catalyst during this reaction. And we, we thought that perhaps water is reacting with the catalyst support causing this loss of BET surface area. So what we did is we just took the actual support itself and we reacted it with high pressure steam um, at 220 degrees C for 24 hours. The partial pressure of water was five atmospheres and the partial pressure of helium was five, also five atmospheres. And you can see the untreated sample, the, B, the untreated silica sample, the BET surface area was 274 meters squared per gram. But after steam treatment, the BET surface area went down to 100 meters squared per gram. So you see a huge loss of BT surface area. Here's pore volume versus pore diameter. You can see a loss of, of pore volume, and you can see a slight shift. So the uh, pores are actually increasing in diameter. So obviously you don't want to uh, make your catalyst on a support that is, will react with one of your principal products. Um, we also, uh, we also looked at those two silica supports using uh, FPIR, TGA, TEM, um, and I won't show you that data due to lack of time, but I will uh, make some conclusions about those data. High pressure steam when reacted with silica causes rehydroxylation of the silica surface, which we see from both FTIR and TGA, a loss of BET surface area. We actually see some Cristobal-like growth. Um, with the FTI, we observed a slight amount of cristobalite growth. And if you read the literature carefully, you'll see that when cobalt silicates are formed, also there is some cristobalite that is formed. And you see an increase in pore diameter. And I'd like to uh, say this new supports will have to be developed that are hydrothermally stable. And Dr. Priestess also talked a little bit about that yesterday. 
And we did the, also did the steam treatment on the actual reduced catalyst. We reduced the catalyst and we did the steam treatment. Um, here's the unpromoted, the 0.5 weight percent platinum and the 2.5 weight percent platinum. See the fresh support is 280 meters squared per gram. After reduction and passivation, all three of these catalysts lose uh, some surface area, considerable amount. And then we did the steam treatments. Um, we did this at the lower space velocity, 1250 for 24 hours. The unpromoted catalyst loses some surface area, whereas the 0.5 weight percent platinum catalyst actually gains surface area, which is uh, rather kind of interesting. And then we did also did the steam treatments at a higher space velocity for 24 hours, and the unpromoted catalyst continues to lose surface area. And we did the 2.5 weight percent platinum catalyst, and this actually gained surface area here. So we tried for 48 hours to see if it eventually would lose surface area, and after 48 hours, it actually does lose some surface area. <laughs> so we hypothesized the deactivation mechanism of the uh, silica surface, where here you have the, uh, here's the actual, these are the primary particles of the silica surface that I show. Um, we can see these with TEM, and uh, you rehydroxylate these, so they, uh, they kind of grow apart, because they're rehydroxylated, and uh, so that causes an increase in BET surface area. If you continue the high pressure steam treatment, then you will actually see uh, that these start growing together and you see some Cristobal like growth. And we've seen this, these two phases with TEM, and we've seen these, these two phases, these, all three of these with BET. And one interesting, more interesting thing is I will show you the TPR of the platinum promoted callus both before and after steam treatment. Here is the 0.5 weight percent platinum um, TPR. This is just after this is after calcination, <coughs> and this one is about 100% reduced at 400 degrees C. All three of these are to scale. Here's the 0.5 weight percent platinum TPR after steam treatment. This is the catalyst that gained surface area. Um, I show you that this one is 33% reduced at 400 degrees C and 81% reduced at 750 degrees C. So you see cobalt silicate formation during these steam treatments which indicates that this water is actually causing cobalt silicate formation. And the unpromoted catalyst after steam treatment was 4% reduced at 400 degrees C and about 86% reduced at 750 degrees C. So to summarize these uh, steam treatments, I like to say that high partial pressure of water causes a loss of chem absorption surface area, BET surface area, activity and formation of hard to reduce cobalt silicate. This activity loss is irreversible, and platinum promotion slows down this loss of BET surface area and the formation of hard to reduce cobalt silicates. So to summarize the promotional effects of platinum, um, one, I'd say that cobalt reduces at a lower temperature. This is probably due to hydrogen spillover uh, during reaction on the platinum surface. Um, two is that the platinum helps maintain the metal free of carbon deposits. It probably breaks down the coke precursors. The platinum lowers the methane production. I'm not exactly sure why. It might be similar to this. And it increases the hydrothermally stability of the support. We suspect that highly dispersed platinum may break apart the silanol groups, which may be responsible for deactivation. Um, you'll have to excuse me, the hydrothermal stability part where we steam treated the cows isn't included in my preprint. If you would like a copy of these slides, you're free to email me at this address and, uh, or Dr. Bartholomew. And we'd like to thank financial support by Mobile Research, Bill and Margaret Pope, and BYU. Thank you.
That's a good question. I mean, how, how relevant is this data to uh, test? I, I think it does show, I think, you know, these are accelerated deactivation tests. So they might show us what's going to occur over the long run. You know, and this test takes a day, whereas if you run the, the catalyst in your actual reactor, it, you know, it takes, might take quite a while to actually see the carbon de deposition. But it does show us that the platinum helps reduce this carbon deposition. I do have a comment there. Uh, we did a similar study of temperature program uh, reaction of hydrogen with uh, carbon deposits on an iron catalyst that was run for different periods of time. And we were able to see a, a lot of different carbon species. And uh, in this analysis here, we haven't really analyzed the, the different carbon species that are formed uh, during this reaction, but what one could back up and do a temperature program hydrogenation and identify those species. And so in answer to your question, there is a way to do that. Yeah, and also after the reaction, you know, I mean, analyze, you know, it's really difficult to It's difficult to say how much But I think temperature program hydrogenation of the carbon deposits can give you that information because you'll see a wide spectrum of carbons that are formed. Also, this was done at low low pressures, atmospheric pressures, whereas in the reactor, you're running at a lot higher pressure. It's a question over here. George, the first question, which I want to talk to you about later, is what's wrong with California? <laughs> <laughs> possible ways to make silica a more a friendlier support and one of them is to go away from the aerogels and the zero gels into the fume type materials and the other one is to um, promote the silica with zirconia in order to promote to uh, inhibit both the agglomeration and the formation of silicates. Have you tried either one of those two approaches to make this problem go away? Well the cobalt catalyst seal that is a fume that's fume silica and we see the deactivation you know on the cobalt catalyst as well as the cobalt diacetyl. Promoting it with zirconium, we didn't try that. Uh, uh, that's the next step, but hopefully I'll be graduating, so. That's for some of the other But you try to, to restore the activity. Did you try to hydrogenate at different temperatures? We just looked at 200 degrees C, and we, we didn't see any uh, after we restored the activity, it was right there. One more question. If there aren't any, it's time for lunch. We will reconvene at 1.30. Let's thank the speaker.